Before we begin, I'd love to just hear um, where you are on your lifetime of love. Uh, we'll go around starting over here. <laughs> um, um, actually, if you could just raise your hands, how many people who have been in committed relationships for over 20 years? Wow. <laughs> All right. Uh, 10 to 20 years. Zero That's to 10 fantastic. years. Single and looking. <laughs> Single and have given up on romance. <laughs> so um, it has been an incredible privilege and joy to work uh, with John and Julie and my wife, Rachel, on this uh, book, Eight Dates. Um, but before we get into talking about um, why dates are important and these essential conversations for a lifetime of love, I wanted to say it's, it's such a pleasure welcoming you to our, uh, the Wisdom 2.0 community, which we've been a part of for many years. And I was talking to many people who said that you are their personal heroes here. So there are a lot of people who are familiar with your work. And we often think of the path of wisdom and spiritual development as a solitary path, something we go on on our own. So I'd love to ask you all about what we can learn in a committed path that's different than what we can learn on our own. I would love to begin with that. I was thinking about that question, and incidentally, um, I want you to know that these are two of the great <laughs> leaders of our world right now. They are incredible. So, <laughs> to begin, okay. So, first of all, I really think that um, what humans need biologically is the following. We are pack animals, right? We need connection. And in terms of our spirituality, what greater test is there than living with a partner 24-7? <laughs> in terms of your empathy, your attunement, your focus, your ability to really be self-aware regarding your own spiritual path, but at the same time to be coming from that place that is the best part of you in a relationship when you're stressed, you're tired, you know, you've just had a really difficult day, your 17 children are screaming, right? <laughs> so um, I really believe that, first of all, relationship is something very, very important that we need, and spiritually, it helps us enormously to grow in terms of making that connection as beautiful, sacred, aware, and empathetic and compassionate as we possibly can. Oh, How would you answer great. that, sweetie? Well, I, I was thinking that George Bernard Shaw said, um, a man can think highly of himself unless he's married. <laughs> and, and so, you know, with, with the exception of being married to Julie Gopp. <laughs> so I think the, the limits of personal growth are encountered in our relationships. You know, so you know, I, like to, I like to say that you know, in our relationship, I control almost all the parameters of money except for the spending part. <laughs> oh, I'm in control, though. Uh, so, <laughs> what? <laughs> well, you know, I think in relationships we find out that we're not so smart, and we find out that, you know, and as I found out, you know, my wife knows everything that can be known, but I know the rest. You know? And Mark Twain said that, so, you know, I stole it from him. So I think you run up against the limits of your abilities. Uh, to, think, to think that you're really a great person in a relationship, and then you open yourself up to influence, and that's where real growth begins. Mm. Uh, the Jewish tradition uh, for about 1,500 years in creating the Talmud was all about arguing. So, you know, arguing is Jewish love. And so it's really, you know, the Talmud is great because it has no dogma, no conclusions, just arguments. And then there are people who argue with the arguments, and then there are people who argue with the arguers of the arguments. That's this book, you know. 
And so I think in relationships, you really learn how to be influential, but also how to accept influence. And I think growth really begins when we run up with our limits to our ability to love. Mm. And Beautiful. So I think it, it's all connected to personal growth mm. as well. Mm -hmm. And please. <laughs> I was recently listening to a playlist uh, that I made for myself and for Doug, a, a love playlist. I was listening to Alanis Morissette, who has been on this stage, um, and she has a song called Everything that I really love. And she says, you see everything, you see all my parts, you see my light and you love my dark. Mm -hmm. And the whole song is about how she's amazing and she's like horrifying and terrible. You know, <laughs> all of these things but that her partner, and in the refrain, you're still here. And to me, that's the piece of the spiritual path in relationship that has been most profound for me, um, which is this, this crazy thing we do. We, we marry someone, or you just choose to be someone with someone for a lifetime, and then you go ahead and project all your unmet needs from your childhood <laughs> onto this person. <laughs> And then you try to see straight while figuring out who's doing the laundry and picking up the kids and buying the groceries. And, you know, you, they get to see your worst, right? Because you get so afraid um, of being rejected or not being seen and you fight. And for me, the best part of being married, there's so many good parts of being married to Doug, but, um, but one of my favorite parts and the place where I feel most loved is when I am my worst self when I am reduced to my most fearful, my most angry, my most intolerant person, and Doug is still here. And he loves me, not just despite it, but in it. And he can see beyond it, usually after we get through the conflict. <laughs> <laughs> you, you were making me think of when we moved in together and um, we were starting to have an argument, and like John was saying, in the Jewish family that I grew up, love was, was argument, and so <laughs> I started shouting, and Rachel, having grown up in a Protestant home, looked at me and was like, are you from Mars? <laughs> <laughs> and I suddenly said, oh, this isn't what everybody does? <laughs> and, you know, it was that accepting influence, as you're saying, and learning, you know, that there are these ways in which we can refine ourselves. It seems like relationships are those proving grounds of our spiritual, emotional development. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that I think is interesting in the spiritual world, there's an assumption that what we're looking for is our soulmate, mm -hmm. some kind of perfect match and, you know, in many cases, almost carbon copy of our, and we know we don't have carbon copies anymore, but as we may use it to describe <laughs> it, of ourselves. And the research doesn't show that we actually are looking for someone who's identical to us. Can you tell us what the research shows? Well, um, probably the best research in this uh, is uh, done by Klaus Wedekind in Germany, who did the T-shirt study where women smelled a bunch of T-shirts that men had worn for two days, heterosexual women. And uh, they picked the one that smelled Fun. the least offensive. And, uh, and turned out that they had picked the the man whose uh, genetics were most divergent from their own. In particular, the genes of the immune system, the major histocompatibility complex. So that's what they're picking. So there's an evolutionary basis for this choice of picking somebody very different. And then recently they did the study of seeing whether these women would like those guys when they met them. And it, you know, it turned out they did. They liked those guys more. So you can kind of take that research and phrase the fundamental problem in relationships mm -hmm. is that we pick somebody very different from us and where relationships go wrong is when we try to turn those people into us. <laughs> Criticize them for not being us. <laughs> and where they go right is when we create symmetry by accepting influence, by caring about our partner's needs, even when our partner's at their worst, you know, and accepting the differences and being enriched by the differences. Julie and I are very different. Uh, her dream, we talked about her dream when we first got married, and Julie was in her seventh month of pregnancy, and she said her Not dream... Not when we first got married. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right. 
Early marriage, I meant. <laughs> <laughs> so easy to screw up in relationships. <laughs> in front of I'm trying to say the right audience. thing, but you know you don't, right? So her dream was to take ten women to Mount Everest base camp and go to eighteen thousand six hundred feet. My dream was to create nonlinear differential equations models of relationship interaction, right? which I can do sitting here. <laughs> I don't have to go sleep on rocks where there's no oxygen. Uh, which my is what she wants to do. My sweetheart gets altitude sick on a ladder, you know, so right. I, go, I change light bulbs. <laughs> right, so we're very different. Um, but the differences have been great. They've, they been, they've enriched us. They are. And you know, one of the cool things that John found in his research is that 69% of all problems couples struggle with are perpetual issues. They never, ever go away. Right? Isn't that incredible? Another thing that was Sounds found- Sounds familiar. <laughs> <laughs> another thing that was found in the research that I was absolutely thrilled to hear is that people who are neurotic can have great relationships. So it was like, right. yes, thank God, I was so happy. So, you know, he's completely healthy. I'm, yeah, yeah, I'm kind of, sort of not. So, you know, we can have a wonderful marriage, a wonderful relationship, not be soulmates, not be perfectly evolved, and still, Enjoy coffee and pastry together, enjoy laughter together, enjoy the ecstasy of being on sea level in a kayak. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, you wanted people to go on these eight dates and have these conversations, and you've obviously you've done 40 years of amazing research, and one of the interesting things about your work is it's actually research-based. I mean, there's so much in the relationship field, which is kind of people's opinions of how you should have a relationship. Right. And you've done this incredible 40 years, had the Love Lab, and written many books about it. What was the reason you felt like these conversations were important for people to have? Mm. Well, two things. You know, we're both clinicians, right? So one of the things that we kept seeing is that there were many, many couples out there who were dual career couples so busy, so consumed by the minutia of life that they didn't have a chance to have those deeper conversations over time. They might have been together for decades and they weren't having profound conversations. Maybe they'd had them during courtship and a, a wee bit afterwards, but as life got busy, that depth dropped away, and things became an endless to-do list. So what we wanted to do was to create a pathway for people to come back into connection with one another at a heart level, at a soul level, at a much deeper level again. And people had forgotten how to do that. They didn't know how to have those conversations. So we picked topics together with Doug and Rachel that were the kinds of things that could really lead couples into much deeper connection with one another right. if they'd been together for 50 years or if they were just getting together and they wanted to see if this person that they're dating right now would be a likely partner for them. Not that they had everything in common, but could they have an inspiring, curiosity, fulfilling conversation with this individual about topics that were not superficial? That's what we were looking for. Yeah, one thing that uh, I've just analyzed data from 40,000 couples who are just about to begin couples therapy, and 80% of them said that fun and adventure were dead in their relationships. Mm -hmm. And so the date on play, fun, and adventure is my favorite, where they can talk about, okay, what, what's your bucket list about adventure that you want to have? What do you want to do? Let's do it together. And how can we play and have fun every day in our lives? And so these conversations are not confrontational. They're about really setting fire to curiosity about one another, just like Julie said. Mm -hmm. 
And it was so much fun to create these sort of seeds of connection in these eight dates together. All four of us did this together with a lot of love. That's good. <laughs> yes. yeah. um, you know, one of the things that's so interesting in your research that kind of goes throughout all the dates is that there's either an upward spiral of positivity in a relationship or a kind of downward spiral of positivity. Right. And it seems like you've studied like the masters and the disasters of relationship, and it seems like that is, cuts across all of this. Can you say a little bit more about, you know, that, you know, why po that positivity seems to predict successful marriages and the negativity seems to... Well, you know, the thing that's so interesting about, about that is that in all relationships, people mess up just because there are two brains in a relationship. And so the, as good as it gets in a relationship, and what the masters are doing is repairing when it doesn't go well, when you say the wrong thing like I just did, you know. <laughs> uh, you know and, and then you can sit and talk about, well, what did you mean, what were your intentions, and you calmly really connect. So the upward spiral is not that you have to be perfect. It's that when you screw up, you can actually talk to each other and repair that and learn how to love better over time. Mm -hmm. That's what I would say about that. What would right, you say? Right, right. Um, you know, I think what we're trying to do in this book is to create more of that positive connection. So one of the things that came out from the research is that even during conflict, the master couples, the ones who are really successful, have a ratio of five to one positive little interactions to one negative, five to one, even during conflict. During non-conflict, it's 20 to one. And one of the things that we saw when we asked couples to stay in an apartment lab for 24 hours, just like a B&B, &B, totally comfortable, read the newspaper, bring groceries, cook meals, except there are four cameras in the wall. There's halter monitors measuring, you know, physiology. We're taking their urine, we're taking their blood, but it's a great B&B &B experience. <laughs> so, so, you know, what we saw is that the best relationships had these beautiful moments of positivity. You know, so much of couples' work is about fixing the conflict, right? Managing conflict. But what we also saw is that positivity turning towards each other's bids for connection, responding in some way to people's needs, when they express their needs, when they even just say, hey, Charlie, does Charlie come back and say, yeah? What is it? That counts for a lot. And the masters were turning towards each other's bids for connection 86% of the time, the folks who were troubled, 33% of the time. Right. See how important positivity is. So this book was designed to enhance positivity and hopefully re-spark even greater positivity moving forward through time together. Yeah, good point. Well, uh, we're probably not going to have time to go through all of the eight dates, um, but I think you know it was interesting that these were the kind of make or break topics that you felt were so important for people. Can you pick a date that is your favorite or you think is most important, and why? You know, what you think is most important to know about it. Rachel, why don't you start? Okay. Well, I like the conflict date. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why. I, I mean, I think because I grew up, my father's a Protestant pastor. I grew up in Southern Illinois. You really have to think like Kentucky, Tennessee, that area. Um, and you know, at my dinner table, conflicts happened like this for about, you know, 25 years, and then they exploded because, you know, my mm. mother decided she was going to be an independent woman and have her own opinions. And, um, it was a terrible model of conflict. Um, and I got together with a, you know, tall, loud, wonderful um, New York uh, Jew, and we had really different styles. 
<laughs> <laughs> and it was very complicated. <laughs> we had to do a lot of work. And what I love about the conflict chapter is there's actually science about this. I mean, who knew? You know, somebody could actually help you through this. Um, and Doug and I often talk about the Gottmans have this wonderful guide for what to do when you've had a regrettable incident. <laughs> Not that that ever happens in your relationships, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but when it happens at my house, we have this dog-eared copy, and you can get it online at Gottman Institute, um, of, of what to do, and it includes taking turns speaking, who knew? Um, <laughs> you know, reflecting back to each other, acknowledging each other. And I, I have to say, I actually, to some degree at this point, we've been together 30 years, um, I actually look forward to some degree to conflict because I know we are getting right into the nugget of something that's going to be a personal breakthrough for me, mm. speaking about relationship as a spiritual path. I know that if I am so angry or so hurt that I'm having feelings like I just can't be with him another minute, I'm on the edge of a breakthrough, right? This is some deep you know, fear within me that I get to actually face and I get to walk through. Mm. Uh, and it has been transformational in my life. Um, and I'm so grateful mm. for it. So mm. what I love about the conflict chapter is it gives you the opportunity to get those tools, those keys um, to how to walk through this in a way that really carves your soul, um, which is, you know, I think when you enter into committed relationship, and not everybody needs to. I'm a firm believer that it's not, it's completely not necessary. Um, but if you want to walk that path, it really is a cauldron for you being called to, you know, to your deepest self, to your finest self, to find, you know, acknowledge your dark, um, but also step into your light. And that's what I like about the conflict chapter. Hey. <laughs> well, yeah, my answer, uh, you know, comes from the fact that we, we, just, we all decided to field test these dates and have 300 couples, gay and lesbian couples, heterosexual couples, all different ages and different lengths of relationship, new relationships and older relationships, go on these dates and tape record their conversations. So I get to listen to, you know, thousands of dates. And the one on trust and commitment is really my favorite. It was so interesting because that's the number one thing that people worry about when they commit to somebody. Can I really trust this person? Are they going to be there for me in the long run? Are they going to be committed to me? Mm. And so the conversations on trust and commitment mm. were very powerful, starting with, you know, how did your parents show or fail to show that they were committed to one another, that they were trustworthy? Mm. And they just took off from there, and people really talked about mm. some of the deepest things they needed to feel safe in this relationship. So I, I love that date. Mm. What's, your, what's your favorite? I think my favorite uh, is the chapter on dreams. Mm -hmm. So, you know, speaking of growing up, um, I grew up in a home that was abusive, uh, and so I would escape all the time into the forest and sleep there and so on, and the trees were incredibly nurturing to me. They were, they were my real uh, parents as well as ancestors. Uh, and I formed dreams sleeping on that forest floor. Coming into relationship, you know, of course all that stuff gets triggered, right, um, from your past. And so it was a matter of learning in my home how to stay in the shadows, never have a dream, never have a need. So I married this incredible man who is secure enough confident enough, caring enough, compassionate enough to first of all want to really understand with empathy that background of mine and how it played a role and to honor my dreams even if they sounded stark, raving mad. <laughs> <laughs> to and me. so, yeah. I mean, to, yes, yeah. to you. That's right. <laughs> and so, <laughs> what are you going to do? So you fall in love with whoever you fall in love with. So, um, and you know, I like math, but um, John wants to share his mathematics with me. <laughs> <laughs> so I use my best therapeutic mm -hmm, 
(laughs) (laughs) Interesting, you know, and um, think about our grocery list. So (laughs) I try to understand, I do. So uh, in any event, so the fact that this man wanted to hear my dreams and not only hear them but support them and see them come to fruition was one of the great joys of my life. And so I'm a big dreamer, and I'm incredibly, incredibly grateful to you for helping me to realize those dreams and actualize those dreams, live those dreams. So, you know, next up on the docket is Kilimanjaro. (laughs) um, Woo, for my 70th birthday, right? (laughs) So, yeah, so um, he's getting used to the idea now. And so that chapter where you're not only talking about what are your dreams here and now, how often do we think about that? What is your real dream here and now? And that dream changes over the decades, right? So talking about that, having the opportunity to bring that up, as well as how were your dreams dealt with growing up? It's a great date. Is just an amazing date, and I love it. Yeah. It's amazing. Mm. Hey. <laughs> Well, we, we only have time for one more topic, and I think what I wanted to explore was the fact that we often think of taking time for the couple as a kind of either in competition to the time with the kids, or we find it's hard to find that time to be away. Um, and I was really struck by one of the pieces of research that you referenced, John, that about how you could tell the impact of the marriage by looking at a child's urine. And I wonder if you can talk about that. Yeah, so we we had a procedure where we got a 24-hour urine sample from four-year-olds, which is a real uh, challenge. (laughs) 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 And so parents did that, and we discovered that we could look at stress hormones in the urine of the child And it was as good a measure of how happy the parents were married as asking the parents with a questionnaire. So kids are carrying around in their bodies their parents' unhappiness and stress. You know, they're seeing them fight in front of one another. And, you know, they're they're scared, they're worried. And you can measure it that way too. So it's a very powerful finding about how important uh, it is for parents to do things like, after they've had a fight, to really make up physically in front of, in front of a four-year-old, you know, and kiss and hug. And Mark Cummings has studied this at Notre Dame, and, and that's what he finds. So, you know, there is a one little tip that if you do have a fight in front of your four-year-old, kiss and make up after you've resolved the argument. You know, it's Thank restore you. Restore calm. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. So it really seems like this, you know, we talk a lot at this conference about compassion for the world, and, but really that compassion at home seems to be central unit for the compassion that we create in the world. Um, thank you, John and Julie and Rachel. So fun to be with you. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.